most strategic messages I have ever preached then, but I don't have that. I don't anticipate any hyperbole in that comment. I genuinely mean that. This may be one of the most strategic messages I've ever preached. Amen? And I'm trusting God that it would be impactful and beneficial for you. And um, as you serve other people, as little people, boy, it'll be impactful for you and for them as you minister to others. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you now, Lord Jesus. We do thank you and praise you, Lord, for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy, for your adequacy, for your sufficiency, oh God. Lord, I just, I'm just thankful, God, as we were praising and worshiping you today, God. We couldn't help but to hear, Father, your word throughout all the songs, God. And God, we thank you, Lord, that God, um, the word says, um, thy word have I treasured in my heart that I might not sin against God. And so, God, we thank you for your word, God. We thank you for the victory that we have. I think about Ephesians chapter 6, God. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness and principalities and high places, oh God. And God, think about God in Ephesians 6, God. You tell us to stand. So I want to pray, God, as we conclude this season of marriage and uh, marriage preparations sermons, that, God, we can stand. Lord, we're encountering, God, a physical warfare in Ukraine. But, God, we're experiencing spiritual warfare in our personal lives. And, God, they both are deadly and they both are fatal. And we need victory, God, in the midst of both of them. So I'm coming today, God, and I'm praying, God, that you will deal with the things that are coming against us right now in our relationships, in our marriages, in our unity, in our intimacy, Father. And I want to pray, God, that, Lord, you come against those things, God, and give us a strategy, God, to have victory. Lord, we're not here for games. We're not here for playing. I want to pray for those who are online, who are watching, God, that, Lord, you would get rid of distractions they may have around them. Popcorn, bacon, rice, eggs, pancakes, whatever. They got. I pray, Lord, you get rid of all the distractions this morning, God. And, Lord, we can hear from you. I'm going to pray in advance, God, that you hold our attention. Because it may go a little bit longer than what we anticipate or what we normally have. It's in Jesus' name, pray ask it all. Amen. We've been in a series, um, uh, um, a series on marriage called Review, gaining a new view on marriage. Amen? And we've encouraged you guys that no matter where you are in your marriage relationship, that you all can stand a review. Before I get going, I want to invite all of our children and youth to go back. Our children and youth ministries are, are wide open. We got our last um, sermon today, last talk today for our youth, um, 7th through 12th grade. So I want to invite you guys to go back to our um, children and youth. Our staff is waiting on you. We're all planned up for you guys. I want to invite you guys online if you're waiting for the children and youth to open back up. It's open, so come on in and enjoy that. Amen? So I wanted to make that announcement so I didn't mess up my marriage anymore. Amen. My wife had to make that announcement. I almost forgot. Amen. Watch this now. So we've been I'm in, a, in a series on marriage, and we've talked about the idea of having a spirit-filled marriage. If there's anything else you've heard in these last three or four weeks on marriage, the most important thing you can hear is that it's important to be filled with the Holy Spirit in our marriage relationships. Amen. And it's not just a start, it's a continuation in our relationships. Somebody fall? Uh, um, oh, but a guitar got happy. And so, um, you know, I'm from Detroit. We don't like sudden movements around us, all right? So we don't play that, all right? And so um, the most important element to your marriage relationship is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And just because you have endured your relationship does not mean you have enjoyed your relationship. As we want to move from merely enduring to enjoyment, amen? And so we've shared last couple about, about, about that whole idea of being filled with the Spirit and try giving you strategies on how to have the marriage that God is satisfied with. And the goal is not just to remain married. The goal is to be used by God to, to, to exemplify Christ's love for the church. So there's a bigger reason behind your marriage and your relationship rather than just you two being together and being happy. If you're preparing for marriage, one of the key questions that needs to be on the table is, how will you and I come together to bring glory to God, expand his name, illustrate and demonstrate his love for the church? Amen? 
Today I want to talk about a topic I don't hear about often, but I think is very needed. And so what happens is we don't want to be negative when it comes to preaching and teaching, and we don't want to talk about negative topics. We want to be very, very positive. And when we come talk about marriage, we want to talk about the goo-goo and the ah-ah and the vacations and the movies and the communication. But the reality is we got a bunch of marriages in a jam. And the challenge is, how in the world do we help couples when they get into a jam? And so what I've observed in my life is that, um, is that very often, even quote-unquote mature couples don't know how to navigate when their marriage gets in trouble. One of my critiques of the conservative evangelical church is that we've got good theology when things are well. But when things go bad, we don't know what to do. We've got good theology when everything is in order and things are working well and things are well coordinated. But when things go haywire, we don't know how to take our biblical theology, take the truth of God's word, apply it to our lives and triumph over whatever's coming against us. Are we tracking together? So my thesis today is that nothing is impossible with God. Write that down. Nothing is impossible with God. I want you all to remember that. Nothing is impossible with God. I live by two concepts in my life that are foundational concepts in my life. Number one is the WOG, the W-O-G. What is the will of God? Number one, what is the will of God? It don't matter what the odds are, doesn't matter your qualifications, doesn't matter your preparation. The question becomes, what is the will of God? If God is for me, who can be against me? Number two principle I live by is that nothing is impossible with God. I'm going to go ahead and stand up because I got too much nervous energy in my soul today. All right. Is that okay with y'all? All right. <laughs> I don't have one biblical pastor. I've got a lot of passages on today. Amen. What I want to do, I want to address this issue of marriage relationships that get in trouble and that once you get in trouble, how in the world do you get out of trouble? And so I was thinking about this topic this week and um, I thought about the whole idea of a comeback. You ever heard of a comeback? For those of us who are NBA fans, this year's comeback player of the year is probably going to end up being who? Clay Thompson. Clay Thompson plays for the Golden State Warriors. They chose him over me. And um, so I could be with you guys. Smile at me. <laughs> he can shoot a little bit better than me. But he, um, he ended up hurting his, um, hurting his um, 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 ankle or, or leg or something um, in the championship series. Ended up being out for a year. Did rehab, came back, and re-injured himself again, so he set out a second year. But this year he's back and he's playing, he's scoring 25 points, 30 points. He's probably going to be the comeback player of the year. Last year it was Joe Barrow instead of our favorite Dak Prescott. It was a close race, and Joe Barrow ended up becoming the 2021 NFL comeback player of the year. The Mayo Clinic talks about high school comeback players of the year. I mean, college players of the year. They had Aiden Hutchinson, Mackenzie Milton, and J.J. Weaver were the 2021 Mayo Clinic Comeback Player Award winners of the year. Major League Baseball has two comeback players of the year, one in the um, 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 AL and one in the NL. It was Trey Mancini in the American League and um, Buster Oldney in the National League in 2018. For those of you all who love tennis, Serena Williams was the comeback player of the year. And those who love Major League Soccer, anybody love Major League Soccer? Who loves Major League Football? I mean, it's a major sport in the world, right? Um, um, Carlos Gill was the comeback player of the year. Since we have comeback players of the year in the NBA, in the NFL, in college sports, in Major League Baseball, in the World Tennis Association, in the Major League Soccer League, how do you make a comeback in your marriage relationship? Now, some of you all feel like because you had a great date night this weekend, everything is good. And praise the Lord, it probably is good. 
But are you prepared if things go bad? And what do you tell your friends, your neighbors, your nieces, your nephews, your co-workers, when things go bad in their marriage, what do you tell them? Be patient. I'm going to set this up. And then I'm going to give you guys five choices you have to make for a comeback marriage. Today, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a bunch of passages. It won't be just built on one passage, it's one concept. And that concept is nothing is impossible with God. Y'all good? I know I get excited, but I don't want y'all to miss the substance of my shout. Smile at me. So what are some of these passages, Pastor Womack? Number one is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think according to the power at work within us. Unto him who is able. Luke chapter 1, verse 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. Matthew 19, 26, if you're online and you're tracking with me. But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Luke 18, 27. But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Jeremiah 32. Some of y'all said, that's already too many passages, Pastor. I got to build this case this morning. Amen. Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Verse 27 of Jeremiah 32. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Mark 10, 27. Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. You know, a number of years ago, they had this show called The Extreme Makeover. Y'all remember that show, The Extreme Makeover? Yeah. Um, raise your hand, or uh, boy, raise your hand at home if we remember that show, boy, The Extreme Makeover. You guys remember that show? And boy, they would go in and do some extreme makeovers and do renovations and all that kind of stuff. Well, I went online and said, you know what, what, what do you do? What's the process if you want to renovate an entire house? They said, number one, you've got to start with a plan. You need a whole house renovation checklist. Number one, make drawings. Number two, have a list of what you're going to do and, what, and, and, and um, what you'll contract out. Number three, find contractors in your area that fit your budget. Number four, get any city permits you need lined up. Y'all do know certain work require permits, right? Smile at me. That's for your protection. Number five, all of this is necessary before you begin any type of remodeling. Number one, check the bones of your home. Um, do inspection on your foundation, your siding, your roof, your windows. Number two, begin demolition. Get a large dumpster to hold all the waste you're going to be moving. Number three, or, or, or C, frame out the new structures. D, get all new electrical, plumbing, and duct work. E, insulate the walls, then hang drywall. F, install windows and carpentry. G, finish out the walls. And H, put down new flooring. How many of you all really want to renovate a house? Say, Pastor, I don't recognize all that was involved with renovating a house. You know, if you're like me, you would do it yourself kind of guy, right? I mean, save some money, right? Like I share with y'all a testimony of doing it yourself. So I shared with you guys a couple of weeks ago how we got this stuff called crab grass in our lawn because some of my, because some of my neighbors don't take care of their grass and them seeds be blowing and turning into weeds in my lawn, right? And so I got my boys out there, but we were digging stuff up to get up this crab grass and all that kind of stuff. And so I was pretty proud of the work I had done, but I had went and picked up a pallet of grass and dug up some stuff and moved some stuff around and put the grass down. You know, it's going to level out at some point. It's going to look good. We're going to water it for three weeks, for four weeks. And then I called the irrigation guy to check my sprinkler system. And he came out and I said, man, look what I did. He don't know a whole lot of English, but he knew enough to say this. He said, garbage. 
I looked at him. He said, garbage. I said, what do you mean? He said, that's no good. That's garbage. And so I didn't get to finish. I said, well, can you do better? He said, I can do better. I said, when can you do better? And so he came out this week, and I, th I think it was Wednesday he came out, and he had a couple of guys with him, and he had a trailer on the back, and he had some equipment I didn't even know about. And he started digging the lawn up, and they started digging stuff up. So much so, I, call, I, say, I, say, I say, honey, look outside and look at what they're doing. I say, we wasn't going to do that. <laughs> I mean, I had good intentions, I had a great vision, but I didn't have the know-how and I didn't have the equipment, I didn't have the workmen to get the job done the way the job needed to be done. And how many of us are doing it yourself, marriage rehab? Doing the best we can do, and boy, if an expert come and look, they're going to look at us and say, I don't mean to offend you. Garbage. I don't mean to offend you after all your efforts and all your energy and well, all, your, all your strategies, garbage. It's hard to difficult to overcome tragedy and dissatisfaction in marriage when there's not a philosophy, a theology, and a strategy of marriage restoration. And I want to suggest that most times you have not been equipped with a theology, a philosophy, and a strategy for marital restoration. I even tested it. I text on my, some of my best pastoral friends and say, man, what is your strategy for marriage restoration? And most of them said, I don't have one apart from recommending them to counseling. And I told you all, most marriage counseling is not working. Most preaching on marriage is not working. Most teaching on marriage is not working. Because if it was working, we wouldn't have all this divorce in our country. Amen? So the question becomes, we seem to have the impression that if it does not work, hear me out, hear me well now. We seem to have the impression that if it does not work over an extended period of time and remains difficult, we are done. Pastor, I'm tired of this relationship. I'm tired of that woman. I'm tired of that man. This can't be God's will. How much effort should we put into the restoration or the renovation of a relationship? Theology is important because it determines the parameters and perspectives we should have of our relationship. Philosophy is important because it is an expression of our cumulative beliefs. So for those of you all who are in education, you all have heard of Bloom's Taxonomy and um, the first three elements in the old school Bloom's Taxonomy is knowledge, comprehension, application. And, and but, 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 but watch this now. That's not where you want to get stuck. What you want to do is move to the level of synthesis and evaluation. And when it comes to biblical theology and God's word and God's truth, God's word is not to be worshipped. God is to be worshipped. And then God's word is to, be, um, 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 is to be integrated and referenced and sourced and applied to our lives. Amen? Amen? But the problem is we don't know God's well enough. God's word well has become fluent in God's word. How to apply God's word to various situations. So... This is important. So watch this now. When you have these rehab properties, have you ever asked yourself, why does somebody want to pay me for a house I don't want anymore? Why would somebody come and give me money and pay me for what I deem as, 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 as no longer desirable, as no longer salvageable? Why would somebody else come and want to purchase that? How is it that one owner leaves in frustration and willing to unload the home at a very discounted price due to frustration, aggravation, and hopelessness while someone else is willing to take on the project without being alarmed? It is because one person does not have the motivation and the vision for what it can be. See, in relations, when they go bad, people lose the motivation and the vision for what the relationship can be. See, when you first get married, you got major vision for your marriage, don't you? We're going to do this. I ain't going to gain no weight. And we're going to go there. And we're going to smile at me, right? We're going to do all this stuff, right? One person has the knowledge of the restoration and renovation and also a strategy to do so. One person can see further than the current state to a much better state. 
My goal today is to equip you with a strategy, actually five choices, for marital restoration and renovation. Are you guys still with me? Is it the real issue that we don't know how to recover from a fall, from a setback, from a losing season or losing seasons? In sports, we talk about a losing culture. In business, we talk about a toxic or non-productive environment. In marriage, we talk about irreconcilable differences. My goal is to give you with a theology, a philosophy, a strategy you can use in the lives of others or your own marriage to make a comeback. Isn't it interesting that, boy, at the crux of theology is that God is supposed to be able to renovate, to restore, to, 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 to regenerate, to, to give a new beginning. But then when it comes time to apply that new beginning, when it comes time for that restoration, when it comes time for that renovation, when it comes time for it to be refreshed, we don't believe that God can do it. That because it's gone bad, it's going to be bad. Because it went ugly, it's going to remain ugly. That's antithetical to who God is. I had a friend of mine, he was a friend too. And he once said, you know, Womack, once a person gets to a certain age, they just don't change. Now, I didn't start an argument, but I disagreed with that comment. And I thought to myself, if that's true, we ought to all close our churches, hang up our Bibles, and stop singing worship songs. Because if we get to a certain age where God cannot transform your life, God is not who he says he is. So theology, God is the God of a breakthrough. Theology, ology means study. Theo, the, um, theo comes from the Greek term theos. You put them together. It's the study of God. When you study God, God is the God of a breakthrough. God is a God of restoration. Philosophy, God has given his church the revelation necessary for restoration. God has given couples, God has given marriages the revelation necessary for the restoration of relationships. God has given his church what's necessary for revitalization of, 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 of marriages and, and relationships. God has given his church what's necessary for redirection. And God has given his church what's necessary for rededication. Where are you at today in your relationship? Is it restoration, revitalization, redirection, rededication, or rejoicing? So what's the strategy? God's word, watch now, God's word applied will lead to introspection. Watch this now. Second Peter says that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. If that's true, how do we come to marriage relationships, but don't go to the church, don't go to the people of God, don't go to the Word of God, go to a counselor. That's antithetical to what God has said, that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Hello? Y'all still here? Are y'all hang up on me online? Smile at me. God's Word applied will lead to introspection. God's word is sharper than any two-edged sword, divided unto joint and marrow, soul and spirit. Number two, God's word applied leads to motivation and inspiration. Isn't that what happens in relationships? You kind of lose the motivation. You lose the inspiration. You kind of lose the want to, the, to, to but want to do something in a relationship. I had lunch with um, 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 Bill Goff on Friday. And Bill Goff came here and taught about five or six weeks on discipleship. And one of his statements that stuck with me is sometimes we lose our want to to want to. Anybody here ever lost their want to to want to in your relationship? If you've been married a long period of time, at some point in time, you've lost your want to to want to. Can I get a witness? <laughs> God's word applied leads to application. God will show you exactly what you need to do. Number, number five, God's word, okay, I'm at the fifth thing. God's word, believe, can lead to transformation. God's word will transform your relationship. Amen? So, I'm still setting up these five things. I'm looking like that. When is enough enough in God's book? I know what y'all thinking. Well, pastor, you ain't lived what I lived. You ain't been married to what, not who, but you ain't been married to what I'm married to. 
<laughs> you know you're in trouble when your mate go from a who to a what. <laughs> when is enough enough in God's book? Because, Pastor, I hear what you're saying, but, but, Pastor, it just couldn't work. It just ain't going to work. It will never work. When is enough enough? And God gives us three times, God says, three times when enough is enough. See, guys, it doesn't matter when you say it's enough. It matters when God says it's enough. Matthew 19 covers two of these. Number one is when there is infidelity present. God does not give you a command to divorce, but he does give you the concession to divorce. It got quiet again up in here. All righty. Number two, number two um, um, is the hardness of heart. We don't talk about this one much, but turn to Matthew 19. Y'all good? Now, when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee. You know, but it's going to be a minute. Pull out your drinks and your pipes, all that kind of stuff, right? Now, Jesus had finished these sayings. He went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? So the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were not partners in Scripture. They wanted to attack Jesus. The Pharisees were the ones supposed to know the religious rites and, and boy, how to put the laws together. And they're supposed to be the wise spiritual people of their day. They came to test Jesus. He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? That's another sermon. And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. That's for mama's boys. And they shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So God, you know what, here is this, uh, I don't want mankind separated when I've put together. They said to him, why then did Moses, now they want to get scriptural. And boy, be careful when you try to get scriptural with the man who wrote the scriptures. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certain, a specific, a certificate of divorce and send her away. He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. So, boy, he does it's another category we don't talk about, and it's the category of hardness of heart. Once your heart becomes so um, hardened that you won't allow God to soften your heart. That's what happens in relationships. Your pain, your anger, your trauma, your abuse, your frustration it makes you hard. And you become hard towards God, you become hard toward that person. So it says here, Moses, so you know what, do the hardness of heart. But it was not that way from the beginning. Verse 10, Tom said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to get married. And some of y'all said, that's what I was thinking. Uh, verse <laughs> Verse 11, but he said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, but only to those who it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been sold from birth. There are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have been made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this receive it. So when is enough enough for God? Number one, when it comes to infidelity. Number two, when it comes to hardness of heart. 1 Corinthians 7 talks about when a non-believer abandons a believer. Y'all good? In other words, translation, these are biblical justifications to depart your marriage. Are we good? Okay. And then number three, I'm sorry, number four, when is enough enough with God? Matthew chapter um, 16, I'm sorry, Matthew 18, when the elders of a church rule that you're free to be divorced. Y'all good? Turn to Matthew 18. I want y'all to see this. I don't know if you say, well, well, man, we don't need the church. The church ain't this. Well, but God says you need the church. Y'all good? Y'all good? 
He says in verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. By the way, this is how you handle conflict or a brother sin against you. You don't go gossiping. You don't go talking about the person. Verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. That's scripture, right? If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if it, why well, it's got to be a brother? Why can't it be a sister? <laughs> Smile at me. I just be thinking like that, right? Why not? But if he does not listen, take um, one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Y'all still with me? You can't see it here, but the tense of these verbs indicate that whatever, he said, well, touch the church. He means church leadership, church authorities. And so when you take it to the, those who lead the church, whatever the church rules, the spiritually mature people of the church who govern the church, whatever they rule, God's going to go with because they have the heart of God. Are we good? Yes, sir. That's why it's important when you get into a mayor, a jam with your relationship, it's important to go and talk to the spiritual authorities in the church. Y'all good? So far, so good. Let me give you five, five choices to becoming a comeback marriage. Y'all good? The reality is this. Many, of, if, if not most couples, don't have a theology, a philosophy, or a strategy to restore or rejuvenate their marriage. The first choice you have to make is you've got to choose God over yourself. And it got quiet again. I'm going to start piping in some music or something because I need some amens along the way. I mean, turn to Luke chapter 22, verse 44. Luke 22, verse 44. Um, it's the situation with Jesus. And boy, he's wrestling with his desires versus God's desires. And he comes in verse 47, um, verse, verse, verse 44 of Luke 22, and he says, he says, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. What do you do when you're in agony? When you're in pain? When you're frustrated? When you're exacerbated? And being in, 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 in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. How are we tracking together? So, boy, what do you do? What do you do um, 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 when, when there's a challenge there? Look at verse 40. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Have any of you ever prayed for the cup, your mate, to be removed? Lord, 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 if, Lord, if it's your will, move this cup called Sarah. Move this cup called Job from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You know what happens when it comes to these marriage relationships and things get tough and things get frustrating and things become exacerbating and when things become painful and when things become uncomfortable and they become undesirable, you know what happens? You know what happens? We put our will over God's will. So when you come in and visit with me, I listen for a while, and then I ask the question, so what is your biblical reason to pursue this divorce. I mean, I'm a pastor. I'm a preacher. I, mean, I got Bibles. I got books. Bible. What do you expect me to ask you? What do you expect me to say? You know what? I know it's painful. Just leave that joker. Take my car. All right. <laughs> Get away as fast as you can. No, 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 no. It's, the question is not if you're in pain. The question is not if you have legitimate grievances. The question is not if you're frustrated. The question is not if they're messed up. The question becomes, what is God's will? And where we often wrestle, but we choose ourselves over God. 
I'm not happy. I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. This suffering cannot be God's will. There is no hope. This thing is hopeless. This thing got a fork in it. It's dead on arrival. Watch this now. It gets so bad. We say this. You know what? I know I don't have a biblical reason to leave. I'll just disobey God and deal with the consequences. After all, God's a gracious God, right? And so I'll just, I'll just disobey God and just do it. You know what? I'll just ask for forgiveness. That's choosing yourself over God. You've got to choose God over yourself. But guys, at the crux of that, it's not that you're not a Christian. It's not, not that, boy, you're not a believer. It's what, you know what it is? You don't have that much confidence in God and what God can do. It's really an indication of your theology. It's really an indication that you believe God can't handle this situation, so you got to take it into your own hands. So now you become more powerful than God. Are we good? You got to get over your lack of confidence in God. If you don't believe it can be rectified, that's more of a statement of your faith than the ability of God. We live in a fallen world. We marry fallen people. All have sin, past tense, and come short, present tense, of the glory of God. And so we talk about the, the three omnis of God, God's omnipresence, meaning God's present everywhere at the same time. We talk about the omnipotence of God. God has all power to do anything he desires to do. We talk about the omniscience of God. God, 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 God knows everything, both, both, both potential and actual. But then you're saying that, boy, that God who's omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient, he cannot handle your situation. Thank you, sir. He's not able. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all we can ask or think. Watch this now. We sing the song. We quote the verse. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all we can ask or think. He's able to do more than we think, but we think he ain't got the power to resolve this relationship. He said he's more powerful. He can do more than what you think. And so your thoughts fall below his thoughts. That's why Isaiah said his thoughts, not our thoughts, his ways, not our ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are his ways above our ways and his thoughts above our thoughts. You got to choose God over yourself. Scripture clearly says nothing is impossible with God. So when you say it's impossible for this relationship to be restored, you're speaking directly against what Scripture says. I just read to you guys an 89 passage that talks about nothing is impossible for God. Watch this now. Has not God demonstrated he can bring to life dead things and dead people? The Bible's replete with miracles including God bringing people back to life from the dead. If God can bring dead people back to life, can he not bring a dead relationship back to life? To walk out is really an indication. Well, I don't believe God. Watch this now. You got to get over being the Lord of your life. Did you hear what I said? We've got to get over being the Lord of our See, we quote Scripture when it's convenient. We quote scripture when it's consistent with what we want to do. Is God theoretically Lord or practically Lord in your life? Is God theoretically or practically Lord in your life? You know, there's a um, basketball coach. He coaches at um, Texas now. Prior to that, he was at um, UNLV for a day. And then he was at, I'm sorry, he was, he, was, he, was, he was at Texas Tech. And then prior to that, he was at UNLV for a day, literally a day. And prior to that, he was at the University of Arkansas, Little Rock, my alma mater. My alma mater hadn't gone back to the tournament since I played back. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just stating facts. They hadn't <laughs> gone to the tournament back since, well, back when we played there. And um, I, I love watching Chris Beard coach because Chris Beard's coaches 
um, teams are extremely tough. They're extremely competitive. And they gave Kansas a run for their money on yesterday, didn't they? And what was interesting is that what, 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 what um, Chris Beard is an expert at is Chris Beard is an expert of going into high-pressure situation, um, situations and teaching his players how to navigate in the midst of high-pressure situations. Remember in high school, I was a junior in high school. We played in the um, district, um, 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 in the state district, the districts. And boy, um, there were only a couple seconds left. I think we were down by um, two points or one point, And I was on the line. And, and but I had to make these two free throws. And I went there, did my little rhythm, got set. Bong! And missed the front end. Two shots. We lost the game. I choked. It still bothers me today. <laughs> Pray for me. I choked. Next year came. It's tight again. Forget what game it was. Did my rhythm. It's close. Tight with these free throws. <laughs> Went in. <laughs> Went in. Chris Beard is an expert of teaching his players how to navigate the pressure and don't let the pressure get to you. Let me teach y'all a basketball secret. When somebody goes to the line that's tight, don't wash their hands. Don't wash their feet. Wash their back. If their lower back get tight, they butt getting tight. And if they butt get tight, they can't get the proper motion to shoot the shot. That's a fact. How many of our butts get tight when our marriages are under pressure? And we can't function well. We don't know how to manage the pressure. We don't know how to navigate the pressure. We don't know how to keep walking by faith and keep loving God and keep serving God, keep obeying God, keep living for God because the pressure gets too heavy. We become Lord of our own lives. And God doesn't want you to become Lord. God said, you know what? I'm the Lord. Let me ask you another question. Is God theoretically Lord or practically Lord of your life? You don't know until the pressure is on and you're on the line. How do you manage the pressure? So, well, but I'm just trying to pray about what God's will is. Why you got to pray when I already told you? You ain't got to pray about if it's God's will for you to leave your marriage relationship. If you don't have one of these, if there's no infidelity involved, is there, if there's no abandonment by a non-believer involved, if the church elders have not ruled on it, if there's not hardness of heart, there's nothing to pray about. That sounds spiritual, but it's really ungodly. But you really mean, you know what? I'm trying to pray until God gives me a way to weasel out this relationship. I'm trying to pray that God changes the reality that we down by one point and we need two free throws. That's the reality. And you can pray until the hogs come home. It ain't going to change. Why are you praying about what God has clearly revealed in his word? So the question becomes, are you going to be Lord? Or is he going to be Lord? Here's what complicates it. Is that typically by the time you get to that point, you don't plan on obeying God anyway. Looking for exit. John, turn to John 7. They're at this major feast. They call it the Feast of Booths. Um, John 7. I'm trying to help some people, but we get caught in this jam. Y'all good? Verse 14, chapter 7. At the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marvel, saying, how is it this man has learning when he has never studied? Jesus answered them, my teaching is not mine. Stay with me now. My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Watch this now. Here's the statement. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Verse 17. 
If anyone's will is to do God's will. Let me ask you a question. When you're on the line and the pressure is on and you get the temptation to tighten up, is it your desire to do God's will or is your desire really to do your own will? Here's what he says. If your desire is to do your own will, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God. Well, I'm going to spill them on. Watch this now. If your desires do your own will, you will not be able to discern the will of God. If your mind's already made up, if your heart is already fixed, no matter how much you read, no matter how much you quote unquote are praying, watch this now, you will not recognize, discern the will of God because you've shut off the will of God. That's why for as many people, prayer don't work. So well, I want to pray about it. What does that mean? What do you really pray about? Let me ask you a question. How do you know when it's God's will versus it's not God's will? Oh, boy, it'll be rude to say that, right? Well, I'm going to pray about it. Okay, well, tell me. What's going to be the indication God has answered your prayer? So why not just start here? We tracking together? Yes, sir. Now, if you say, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I know I'm going to do God's will, but I don't know how I'm going to do it. That's a different question. Number one, you got to choose God over yourself. Here's a question. Does God really have my best interest at heart? So God's giving me these guidelines. You know what? God's giving me the web escape. God's giving me everything to leave. I don't have one of those four things, and so now I still want to leave the relationship. Does God really have my best interest at heart? Now you begin to question the heart of God, and you begin to question the benevolence of God. You begin to question the altruicity of God. You begin to question the integrity of God. Does God really have my best interest at heart? Is God doing what's best for me even when I can't see what he's doing? Isn't that called trust? Am I pursuing an outcome or am I pursuing God? And the challenge with our faith today, so much of our Christianity today, is that we're not pursuing God. We pursue God to the degree that God's going to produce the outcome we desire. But if we can get the outcome we desire without God, we won't do God. And so now during COVID, period, people losing jobs, losing health, losing family. You know what? You know what? You know what? God's not doing what I want God to do. So I'm just going to dismiss God because God's not producing what I want God to produce. So I really don't need God because God's not producing. Go get the CD, listen to it again. <laughs> and that's what happened. We're not pursuing God. We're pursuing the blessings of God. We're pursuing the outcomes of God. We're pursuing the resources of God. But when you pursue God, um, 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 yet though you slay me, yet will I trust you. I ain't got to have the stuff. I ain't got to have a house. I ain't got to have a car. I ain't got, you know what, God, as long as I got you, I'm good, God. God has not left believers to fend for themselves and their relationships. He gave us his word, his spirit, and his people to assist us in bringing life to a dead situation. We got the example of life. Number two, okay, number one, you got to choose God over here. Number two, who is going to be a wrong day? Number two, you got to choose victory over defeat. Don't you feel defeated in your relationship sometimes? Raise your hand if you out of You know what? I felt defeated in my relationship sometimes. And see, you know what? It's a bunch of y'all who ain't raising your hands now. But, and see, boy, that's part of the problem. Because people can't come to the church and be honest. They can go to the club and get drunk and be honest. They can go to the strip bar, get a drink, spend a couple dollars, and be honest. They can go to the frat house, hang out with their frat brothers or their sorority sisters, and be honest. But when they come to church, they can't be honest. Let me ask the question again. How many of y'all, at some point, 
have been dissatisfied, discouraged, frustrated in your marriage. Praise God. Now you've been honest. Okay, now, now you've been honest. I'm sorry to have to get rowdy with y'all like that, all right? Well, I got to get rowdy like that, right? Okay, watch it out. Wait, 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 wait. We got to choose. You feel defeated when your relationship is not working. I've invested so much money, so much time, so much effort into this person, this relationship, and it's not working. I don't want to tell nobody because some of them told me it wasn't going to work in the first place, and now it ain't working. Now I'm embarrassed. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Y'all good? And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Don't 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 give up. Prior to us having our first child, <laughs> my wife made the declaration she wanted to go natural with our kids. I said, go natural what? Go natural. I don't want to have any type of medication to relieve the pain when I have the child. I said, why would you do that? Well, it's better for the baby, all that kind of stuff. So I we went to this thing called a Lamaze class. And, and boy, it was a natural class. Lamar's class. It wasn't a, okay, I'm going to get an epidural Lamar's class. It was a, we're going to go natural and um, have this baby. Now, if you want to get some good sleep, <laughs> go to some of them classes. <laughs> That's the best sleep I've had in my life, okay? <laughs> Breathe in deep and nothing else ringing the bell. Okay, it's time to go. That's a, that's a good class. Uh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> what they teach you in the class is about labor. What they teach you is how to manage the pain and the pressure. How to manage it when you're on the line, it's uncomfortable, we're depending upon you, and the pressure and the pain is on. So they teach you all types of techniques on how to manage the pain. They teach the wife what she used to do, and they teach the husband what he used to do. The husband just kind of duck and stay out the way. All right. <laughs> Duck and stay out the way, all right? <laughs> Duck and go the other way, all right? So, uh, you get back over here. Right? So much more you go there, but they teach you how to help the manager, all that kind of stuff. But they also say, you know what, Dad, part of your job, Dad, when they get to a point to where they ask for epidural, your job is to remind them of the decision they already made. And then when you remind them of the decision they already made, then you ask them to give you 10 more contractions. And then if they still want to get the epidural after those 10 contractions, then you try to get them the epidural. They teach you about this thing called EAT, um, early, active, and trans. I mean, I could be a doctor. <laughs> I mean, well, um, early, active. In fact, we delivered two babies, and it wasn't even a doctor in the room. That's fact. And I asked him, will you give me a discount? <laughs> <laughs> Since what? No doctor in the room already. <laughs> they said no. I did ask already. Already. Early. I wouldn't have no baby. I was paying the bill. All right. Early active transition. They say, when you get to the point of transitional labor, it's going to become almost unbearable and extremely painful. And at that point, you've got to focus, you got to do your breathing, you got to do your things to, um, 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 boy, to mitigate the pain. And they, said, and they said, typically, by the time you get to the 10th contraction, if you get to the 10th contraction, you already have a baby. We've gotten there several times. I don't know the exact count. But we said, baby, baby, just give me 10 more. And before we get to 10, we got a baby. How many of us are giving up at the early stage? We're giving up at the active stage. But when it gets to the height of the pain, that's the transformational moment. 
and we didn't recognize, although our pain was high, we were at the threshold of deliverance. Too many of us give up too soon. You got to choose victory over defeat. Verse 9 says, do not become weary doing good. And some of y'all say, Pastor, I'm tired of doing good. When you get physically tired, don't give up. When you get tired spiritually, rest. Watch this now. You've got to get connected with your disconnection. See, when you're in pain, all you focus on is the pain. You know what? I don't want to be here. I got so much pain. They at fault. They wrong. They ugly. They mad. They a liar. They ain't truthful. They don't bring home all their check. All that kind of stuff, right? But watch this now. Last time I checked, it takes two to tangle. Are we tracking together? Now, I'm not saying that, boy, they not worse than what you are, but you're pretty bad, too. Okay, I ain't getting no amens there either. I keep, a, I, I keep a dozen amens in the office, so when I come out to service, I can go pick them up, right? Here are five questions. What flaws do I bring to the table? See, people often focus on the reaction. They don't focus on their action. What have I brought? What kind of environment have I cultivated in the relationship? Number two, what bad habits do I bring to the table? Number three, what sin do I bring to the table? Number four, what unmet needs do I have? Number five, how do I medicate my deficiencies and pain? So you end up with one or two unhealthy people in a relationship. You got to make sure you choose victory over defeat. I wrote this down. You've got to know your position in Christ and your position in Christ needs to inform your disposition as you're in the state of repositioning yourself. And so what happens is we forget our position in Christ. We forget our identity in Christ. We forget our resources in Christ. We forget who we are in Christ. We forget what, what boy, Christ has done for us. We forget what Christ will do with us, in us, through us, and beyond us. Are we tracking together? And so what happens is we, we, we end up being defeated. We become weary in well-doing. Well, this ain't going to pay off. This ain't going to work. Number three, you've got to choose a new vision over division. You got to choose a new vision over division. The goal in marital restoration is not to change everything that's happened in the past. Well, let me tell you what happened. Tell me what happened. Tell me what happened. So I had a guy call me a couple weeks ago. And boy, I'm cool with the calls. I love that, all that kind of stuff. You know, um, I'm down with that. So, well, no problem. We can talk whatever. So I'm talking to the guy. He tell me what's going down in the relationship. I said, okay, well, come on. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. All that kind of stuff. Man. Come on, we're going to do A. We're going to do B. We're going to do C. And man, don't worry, man. I'm not going to trip on you because of your bad habits, because of what you've done. Apart from the grace of God, so go I. We all are sinners. All have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. Even though a bunch of people forget that, I remember that. And so, boy, um, 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 we were born in sin and shaping in iniquity, according to Psalm 51. So we all have sin. We just got different sin habits. Not to excuse sin, but we all have sin. Amen? We all have sin, right? Okay, see, I, I, need, I need another class. <laughs> right about it. Y'all ain't being honest again. All right. All right. We all have sin. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hey, Bush, he talking about you. All right. So, watch, watch, watch. <laughs> so I, I said, man, cool. I said, all right, man. So, man, you know what? I know there's two sides to every story, and so what I want to do is I want to meet your wife. He paused and hesitated. You know why, don't you? Because he don't want his wife telling me the real deal. <laughs> and so we're talking again. I say, all right, man, um, do A, B, C, and D. And I need to meet with your wife or whatever. And his wife did not want to meet. She says, you know what? I don't want to meet because I, I need somebody who understands a woman's perspective. And I thought to myself, you've got no idea what level I'm on. You think I'm reducing this to man's level? You think I'm reducing this to he said, she said? You think I'm reducing this to a tennis match that, boy, you hit the ball, you hit the ball back. You think I'm trying to keep score? You think I'm a referee? I'm a man of God. I'm bringing God's truth, God's wisdom, God's word, and God's principles, and we ain't trying to keep score, and we ain't trying to rectify, and, boy, even up what's happening, we're trying to create something new. 
when somebody goes to the hospital in cardiac arrest, and they're sitting there, but they're getting a heart transplant. The surgeon is not asking, and well, I've been there. I've stood, I've stood this far. I've stood this far from a heart transplant with the heart and the chest wide open. And, 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 and the cardiologist never asked the question, how did he get here? If he would have only not smoked, if he would have only walked more, if he would have only ate um, different food from that ch um, fried chicken, macaroni and cheese, and candy yams, and greens, if he wouldn't have ate over at Mud Deals, he wouldn't be, that ain't what he's saying. You know what, I got I to gotta get these veins from down there, and boy, I, I got to bring these veins up here, and boy, do this bypass, boy, I got to get this heart pumping, and boy, I'm talking to the anesthesiologist, boy, who's, who's boy, operating the um, heart, lung, and other machine, and boy, I'm trying to make sure everybody's courting, but we getting this stuff done, but no, nobody's getting infected, but we get them out here on time, but we're not focused on that small level of stuff. See, it's amazing what inexperienced amateur people think in contrast to what professionals do. And part of the challenge is we got amateurs trying to fix the relationship they messed up. <laughs> Are we tracking together? And so, if you know me well, you know I love to learn. And I ask 300 billion questions to anybody I talk to. I'm a sponge. I'm trying to learn. So I've learned to keep my mouth shut. I'm around somebody who knows more than what I know. I'm going to write it down and come repeat it to other people like I came up with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got to choose a new vision. We're not trying to, to rectify the tits and the tats. We're trying to create something new. Get over what's getting over in your relationship. We can't change it. We can't rectify it. We can't, we can't withdraw the pain. Get your faith, watch this now, get your faith over your, when you create a new vision over division, you got to get your faith over your feelings. And how many of us walk in our feelings? Our feelings are controlling it, all that we do. Faith over framework, watch this now. First Corinthians, I'm not, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5 says, to the pulling down of strongholds. You've got to have faith over your framework. Number two, faith over what you see and have seen. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Are you focused on what you see or are you focused on the evidence of things that you do not see? Number three, watch this now. You know what keeps us from creating a new vision over our current division? It's fear. You've got to have faith over your fear of being hurt again. Somebody said illustration one time. I said, you know what? If you go through a door and boy, your hand gets slammed in the door, the next time you walk past that door, what you going to do? Because you don't want to get your hand slammed in the door again, right? And what happens in, in relation to what? I'm not going to trust again. I'm not going to love again. I'm not going to sacrifice again. I'm not going to be vulnerable again. You've got to have faith over your foolishness. I'm going to trust God over going out and doing something stupid because of what's not happening in my home. I'm going to prove them wrong. You've got to get the truth over your emotions. Y'all okay? I'm trying to help you. I know it's a little bit longer. But we need a strategy, we need philosophy, we need theology to work our way through tough places. Number one, you got to choose God over yourself. Number two, you got to choose victory over defeat. You know, become weary with them. Number three, you got to choose vision, a new vision over division. We're not trying to, to, to rectify it all. We're trying to create something new because what, what was old wasn't satisfying, right? Number four, we got to choose humility over pride and judgment. Turn to 1 Peter 5. Does not pride get in the way sometimes? Because, boy, when we get hurt, you know what? This is, this is a tough conversation. Ushers, lock the doors. <laughs> <laughs> Choose, watch this now. We become prideful. You know what? I'm better than them. 
I would have never done what they did. I would have never said what they said and have gone with what well, they have gone. I wouldn't treat my mate that way because I'm inherently better than what they are. Well, you have to be careful from moving from being a victim to being a violator. Nobody's questioning your victim. But you know what? Well, you have been victimized. You have been hurt. You have been mistreated. But don't use this as an excuse to become a violator. Are we tracking together? And so, and so, First Peter, First Peter five says this: Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time He may exalt you. Verse seven: Casting all your cares on Him, because He cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowl, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith. Knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Don't you want God to confirm, to restore, to strengthen? and to reestablish your relationship. Then they kind of go. Here, here are four things you will say when you're humble in your relationship. Y'all ready for this? Yeah. Number one was, I was wrong. If your mate's here right now, just look at them. Look at them, don't look at me, look at them. If you're at home, look at your mate. They might be, they might be sleeping, they might be just, just, just look at them. You know they sleep, just look at them. Say, I was wrong. No, look at her. Look at him. Say, I was wrong. You know how many relations can be changed if we just say, I was wrong? Number two, say, I love you. Number three, I need you. Number four, I'm attracted to you. Let's see what everybody didn't say that. Everybody didn't say that. Everybody didn't say that. All right. All right. Everybody didn't say that. Let's try it again. All right. Look at me now and say, I'm attracted to you. All right, give him a kiss. All right, go, go ahead, give him a kiss. All right, all right. If you can't kiss in church, you can't kiss nowhere. Uh, all right. <laughs> this, this holy ground right here, right? You can't kiss anywhere. Can you kiss? Brother Holman, did you kiss your wife? Did you kiss your wife? Brother Holman, my buddy, he, ate, he, he kissed her hand. She don't want no kiss on the hand. Uh, <laughs> he's going to be teaching us evangelism in a couple. He's 82 years old. And um, he was retired from American Airlines. He was an um, 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 avionic, a, aviation engineer. And um, he studied under Martin, um, Ralph Martin, very wise man. I'm just picking on him. Walter Martin, I was like, Walter, see what he corrected me. Now, you, you, did you kiss her right? I'm trying to correct me. <laughs> great man of God, great man of God. Watch this now. We got to have mercy over judgment. James 2.13. I know it's a bunch of scripture today, but this is a big problem. James 2.13, I gave y'all a warning. For the judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. James, James 2.13, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Type mercy into your chat, please. Mercy is withholding the wrath another person deserves. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Lastly, number five, you got to choose love. Y'all good? Choose God, choose God over yourself. Choose victory over defeat. Choose a new vision over division. Choose humility over pride and judgment. And lastly, choose love. You know what? We treat love like an emotion, don't we? Um, how that song go? Who needs love? Is that a hand emotion? All right. Love is a commitment. Love is an action. Love is not just an emotion. Amen? Matthew 5, verse 4 through to 48 says this. Matthew 5. What verses? Oh, 43. Okay. What the, okay. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies 
and pray for those who persecute you so that, so that you may be the sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do, 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 do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you get only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. This idea of perfect is the idea of maturity. Maturity is the ability to live in congruity with God's will. Maturity is the ability to live in congruity with God's will. He says that you have maturity, you're perfect in your love when you're able to love the person you deem to be your enemy. Now, theologically, Ephesians 6 says that we rest not against flesh and blood. But when you're angry and upset with your mate, you're like, they the enemy. Smile at me. You've been sleeping with the enemy. You might as well start loving the enemy. Hello? You all right? And so, boy, so, so watch this now. When you, don't, when you don't love, you don't do the things to cultivate love in your relationship. When you are filled with the Spirit, you take the initiative to love your mate so you would do what's necessary to express love in your relationship. So what happens is you stop cultivating the relationship. You stop watering the grass. You stop putting down fertilizer. You stop putting down pre-emergent. You stop putting down post-emergent. Before you know it, you got a field of weeds. God says, well, well, when you do all the other things, every once in a while a weed may pop up what I've learned in my agricultural black thumb <laughs> is that healthy grass chokes out the weeds. Are you cultivating healthy grass in your relationship? And so watch this now. The issue is, you know what, well, but I don't love them no more. And so when you don't love them, you stop doing the things that love produces and you stop cultivating healthy grass in your relationships. Amen? But God says just because you don't love them doesn't excuse you from being lovable. He says, love your enemies. So at the minimum, treat them like enemy. We're tracking together. He says, See, you know, what's the benefit when you, when, you, when you do good to somebody who's not your enemy? 1 Corinthians 13. So watch this now. Um, in fact, let, okay, let's turn two places. I ain't going to rush. I watched a couple of overtime games yesterday. So they were good. This is good. Amen. I'm almost done. Seriously. Galatians 5 verse 16. But I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desire. See, what happens, God? We get these big old problems, but, 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 but we won't tweet about solutions. And we wonder why the tweets ain't healed our marriage. Because the tweet wasn't designed to address the level of dysfunction you're facing. But I say walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of, of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For, there, for these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, not under the law, that the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let me ask you a question. When it comes down to marital breakdown, do the things that have some relationship show up in that list? Do the vices and the offenses show up in that list? The root of it is that a person is, is, is being led by the flesh and not being led by the spirit. Verse 22, but in contrast to that, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Again, such there is no there, there is no law. Let me ask you a question. If these things, notice that fruit is singular, it's fruit. If, if these things, if love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control were present in your relationship, would it be in a condition that it's in right now? It wouldn't be. It goes back to the Spirit again, right? Last verse. No, I got two verses. 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient and kind. 
Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoice with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. Uh oh. Love endures all things. Verse 13. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest is love. You got to choose love over hate. These are five things that we can apply to, to have a comeback marriage. I put together graphics. I was thinking through the, the level of interventions that we have. I don't know if y'all know or not, but I do think through my sermons before I come up here and talk to y'all. That's fine. <laughs> can y'all put that graphic on the screen, please? I call it the uh, marriage intervention triangle. And so, boy, um, what are the levels of intervention. And so typically our first thing is to run to a counselor. And my suggestion is that very often we don't need a counselor. We need discipleship. We need godliness. Okay. So number one is self. Start with yourself. What can you do to make, make, make now boy, if, if you, if you're taking pictures, make sure you cash at me. <laughs> I got royalties on this stuff. Uh, uh, so, um, <laughs> okay. Back to being serious. Okay, first thing you got to work on yourself. What needs to change me, myself, and I, my personal walk with God? Then you want to move to personal discipleship. Have you been discipled? What I've learned is that most couples have not been discipled. Most people have not been discipled. They've never gone through a process of learning how to glorify Christ and then how to go reap the promise for somebody else. Number three, um, where, you and your, um, where you and your mate go and get help outside of yourselves. I'm sorry, you guys don't work together. Read a book together. Working the sword plan together, praying together, worshiping together. Uh, next is get a marriage mentor. You know, the thing about marriage is you don't know what's normal, what's not normal for a couple very often. So get a marriage mentor, somebody who's kind of been through the seasons of marriage, fall, winter, spring, and summer, who can talk, you know what, I've been through that. I faced that challenge. And people who you think have always had pristine marriages will tell you it hasn't always been this pretty. We've had some tough times. We've had some rough times. I went up to um, Columbia, South Carolina, to speak at Columbia International University a couple of weeks ago, and a pastor friend of theirs, mine, he's actually a mentor to me. And when um, we were sitting down talking, I had heard a story about he had been in the military, but I didn't recognize he was a paratrooper during Vietnam, and he got shot. You know how much my respect for him went up when I found you know what? He was wounded in the war but yet he was still surviving. See, when you talk to somebody who's been wounded in this thing called marriage, and they're still surviving, your respect goes up for them. Next, you go to marriage conferences, experienced pastoral counseling, experienced, not inexperienced, not somebody who's just sitting there guessing and throwing verses at you, somebody who's got some wisdom and some insight on how to apply the scriptures. Next is, 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 is an experienced Christian counselor, all counseling is not the same. If God's word don't work, ain't nothing going to work. Experienced Christian counselors, and then, if necessary, specialty Christian counselors and coaches. And so if you've encountered um, infidelity, addiction, abuse, trauma, childhood sexual assault, um, um, detachment as you were young, abandonment, you need a specialist. But boy, somebody who's a Christian who can identify with your pain, your issue, and then work from there. Amen? Amen. Let me ask you a question. Where are you? And what do you need right now? Where are you at on this intervention triangle? The bigger the problem, the more expertise is needed. Often the issue is not counseling, but discipleship. I'm writing a book and illustrate it through grass. When you take care of grass, it chokes out the weeds. Are we together? One last pet, I'm let you go for real. Thank you for your patience. Hopefully you find this was beneficial to you. Psalm 25, verse 3. Well, Pastor, what if I try this and it don't work? 
What if I try this and my mate still leaves? What if I try this and my mate don't get any better? What if I do it God's way and don't get the result I want? Indeed, Psalm 25, 3, indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be put to shame who are wantonly treacherous. God makes a promise that when you trust him, you won't be put to shame. Amen?